Sarah Rose, and this is my promotional video for D-Day Girls in Chinese. So I don't think my subject changed at all. The first book, For All the Tea in China, was about Robert Fortune, who was an industrial spy. He went behind enemy lines, that is to say he went into China. He was dressed as a Chinese man, and China at that point was so closed they had no idea that he wasn't Chinese even though he was Western. And he stole tea equipment, tea makers, tea seeds, the entire recipe for tea. It was the largest theft of industrial secrets in the history of mankind. He was very much an industrial spy. So to go from my first book about a spy in the 19th century to my second book about spies in World War II felt like a very natural progression for me. I write the kind of books I want to read, and as a reader, I am much more invested in people than I am in just events. If there's a character whose interior life is a little obvious to me, whose fate matters to me, that I can get invested in, that I can root for, I am much more likely to keep reading, to just keep turning the pages. Then it becomes a thriller. Histories are written from a results-oriented perspective, but characters don't know how a story is going to end as they're living it. And so for me as a writer, that's much more exciting to not know how anything turns out, to not know that D-Day is a success, to not know whether or not Robert Fortune is killed by the Mandarins. And it's a lot more fun. So I write the books I wanna read and I wanna read about people, not just events. Agents, Lisa Basak, Andre Burrell, and Odette Sampson. So Lise, Andre, and Odette were in the very first training class of women recruited by the Special Operations Executive, by the secret agency in World War II. And they were trained together. I'm interested in the pathbreakers. I'm interested in the people who were the very first to break the glass ceiling. And together, Odette, Andre, and Lise were the very first women in combat in Western history, the very first women like in uniform. They were combat paratroopers and they arm and train the French resistance ahead of D-Day. As I was researching, I realized it's not just that they were there for two years. Lise de Basak, for instance, was in Normandy throughout the D-Day invasion. She wasn't just there, she was in command of troops. So we don't hear about the women typically, and we don't hear about women because largely men have been writing war histories and women haven't. But I was even surprised, knowing that this was my subject, that it's not just that she was there at a cr critical moment, she was there and she was in charge. So they're not just the very first combat paratroopers and the very first sabotage agents. She was the very first woman in command of combat troops in history, and we hadn't heard of her. much more interested in women's successes in the book, um, the ways that women were better at the job than men were. So for instance, women had a kind of natural cover going into France. Um, we think about war as this very masculine and macho G.I. Joe kind of situation. It turns out that in an occupied country like France, it's overwhelmingly female. The men are gone. Uh, in France, the men were in jail, they were in concentration camps, they were doing slave labor for Hitler, they were building trucks and engines or the Atlantic Wall. There weren't a lot of men in France. Sending a female agent in made really good sense because there were more women. They blended in better. If you sent a young, battle-aged, fighting fit guy by parachute behind enemy lines, there's a really good chance the Nazis would say, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Why aren't you in a factory somewhere? Or how is it you managed to not be in a concentration camp? Um, so they had a better natural cover by virtue of being women. They also were really good at recruiting a secret army. So women are born listeners. We are trained from the cradle to be caretakers. When you are recruiting 
for an underground army. You're not getting the best soldiers. You're actually getting kind of the worst soldiers. You're getting teenage boys and old farmers. You're getting the people who the army, the regular army, didn't want or couldn't use. And they have a lot of responsibilities. It's a country at war. So they had to ask a teenager to leave their family farm, to leave his mother, and go live in the woods, train as a soldier for this unproven technique. And these teenage boys understandably had concerns. They wanted to know that they'd be okay. The women were really good recruiters. And the allies, to their credit, realized early on the women were used to learning and listening to people's concerns. And the men, this is something they had to learn on the ground as they were working through the war. My big realization while writing this book was that no one knows how history ends while they're living history. I have no idea what's going to happen in 2022 and neither do you. Similarly, when we read about D-Day, we always kind of take it for granted that the Allies won and Hitler lost, but that wasn't a given. None of my characters knew that was going to be true. And it changes the way history is told if you don't know the ending before you start. So the thing I want readers to realize is that this is all a surprise. We look back and we can challenge some of the decisions that these characters made. They were making it up as they go along because they didn't know how anything ended. And it makes a lot of their decisions make sense. And it also makes for a better story, a better read when you want to race to the ending to find out how it all happens. I would like to say thank you for buying my book. I hope you find Andre and Lise and Odette as compelling and interesting as I did while I was working on the book and as compelling and interesting as I found Robert Fortune. If you like reading about people going undercover in foreign territory, then hopefully you will like D-Day Girls as much as you liked For All the Teen China.